I'm James Swanick. This is the Alcohol Free Lifestyle Podcast, where you learn to live a life of health, wealth, love, and happiness. Today, a special episode. Karen Martell from the Hormone Solution Podcast and I are jointly recording a podcast interview. So this episode will appear on Karen's podcast, which is called The Hormone Solution. I encourage you to go and check it out and give it a listen over there. And it's also obviously uh, appearing here on the Alcohol Free Lifestyle podcast. So we're going to be talking about how alcohol affects our hormones. Uh, If you are going through perimenopause as a woman and you're really finding that challenging, how alcohol affects perimenopause. Um, I also go on a bit of a rant, tough love rant, uh, imploring people to stop drinking alcohol. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm, I have a very empathetic and loving, some may say coddling kind of energy. And then other times I'm more tough love and um, I use terminology like wake the hell up. Come on, what are you doing? And today's episode you'll hear is more me saying, come on, wake up. What are you doing? Stop your drinking. It's time to like grow up and do something about this. So uh, if you're more the empathetic, nice kind of touchy feely type, just a heads up, you might feel a little bit triggered by my tonality and how I speak in this episode. And if you are someone who responds to tough love, listen up and uh, listen to me go on my tough love rant. Uh, All right, here we go. Here's the episode with Karen Martell from The Hormone Solution. I've been in the health industry now for 25 years. I have personally witnessed the power of holistic wellness and spirituality. But here's the twist. For nearly a decade, I lived a double life. During the day, I was doing body work and energy healing on my clients. And at nighttime, I would lose myself in the chaos and destruction of alcohol and drugs. Why is it that so many women, myself included at one time, despite their unwavering commitment to physical health, can't bid farewell to the nightly glass of wine or three? How does one break free from this cycle? And is any amount of alcohol truly acceptable? The path to a life without alcohol can appear daunting. But today, my guest and I both are here to shed some light on this darkness that affects so many lives around the world. In this episode, I'm joined by a remarkable guest, someone who, like me and countless others, battled alcoholism head on. Now he's on a mission to to guide high achievers like you in kicking the drink to the curb for good. James Swanwick is an Australian-American investor, entrepreneur, speaker, and former Sports Center anchor on ESPN. He's the creator of the Alcohol-Free Lifestyle, which helps people change their relationship to alcohol. The host of the podcast, Alcohol-Free Lifestyle, and creator of Blue Light Blocking Glasses, Swannies, which I'm sure many of you probably wear, by Swanwick Sleep, which improves your sleep. So welcome, James. I'm really happy to be co-hosting this with you. Karen, thank you very much for having me. I so appreciate that. And uh, yeah, we're playing this episode on my podcast as well, which is the Alcohol Free Lifestyle podcast in Spotify. So to my listeners, this is the uh, lovely Karen Martell, and she's the host of the Hormone Solution podcast uh, and mostly helps women who are going through perimenopause and menopause. And uh, we're going to be having a fun conversation today. So hello to your podcast listeners, Karen, and hello to mine, of course, at Alcohol Free Lifestyle. Yes. Hello, everyone. (laughs) This is kind of, this is a new little little thing for me, actually. I I usually do roundtables, but James and I really wanted to just have a discussion about midlife kind of women and the effect of alcohol on us. And uh, we both have a lot to say about this topic. So we wanted to kind of both put our our two cents into, into this interview. So let's start. I would love for you to share your story. I know your audience probably knows it, but I think a lot of the time that, you know, we've talked about our stories on, you know, other podcasts, or we talked about it in one of our first episodes, and then we don't talk about it again. So please share your story so that people can kind of, you know, hear that again. And then for some, the first time. I was a socially acceptable drinker growing up in my home country of Australia. And by that, I mean, I had two or three drinks a night, most nights of the week. And then I would probably drink considerably heavier on weekends. Sometimes I would get drunk, but I wasn't really um, waking up in a ditch or getting arrested or getting a DUI. I was just a socially acceptable drinker. 
But I got to the age of 35 and I realized that that socially acceptable drinking had led to me being about 30 pounds overweight. I was tired. I was irritable. I was foggy. I wasn't sleeping great. I was procrastinating in many of my goals. My financial life was eh. My relationships were eh. And I just kind of felt like blah. And then I woke up one morning. I was in Austin, Texas in 2010. I looked in the mirror. I was like, man, you're overweight. You look tired, weathered, had bags under the eyes. And I just committed to having, um, well, I committed to what I thought would be a 30-day break from alcohol. And in those 30 days, I lost 13 pounds. I slept better. I got my dream job hosting a television show called Sports Center on ESPN. My relationships improved. And I thought, this is pretty good. I might just keep going. And so I did. And I haven't drunk since then. That was in 2010. So as we're recording this, it's coming up almost uh, 14 years now since I've had a, a drink of alcohol. And in that time, I've now created an organization and a movement, I guess, where we help uh, people to have a better relationship with alcohol. I also have a sleep company called Swanick Sleep. We produce these blue light blocking glasses, affectionately known as Swannies. And I live a life of health and wellness, and I just create businesses that are an extension of my uh, healthy lifestyle, so to speak. So that's, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Yeah, geez, we're almost on this exact same timeline then. So that's from Yeah, what was I, your story? Because yeah, that was right around that time too. I had quit a little bit prior back in, I started the same, exactly the same way as you did, like needed, just decided I'm going to do the 30 days, <laughs> which then ended up being a lifelong thing. But um, mine was, as I said in my intro, you know, I was a pretty heavy drinker. I would, and I was living this parallel lifestyle of being in this holistic wellness space and really into it and really good at what I was doing and was getting into energy healing and self-help and was going to school down in Colorado and like learning so much about that world. And then I was working at nightclubs at nighttime, partying all night long, you know, doing drugs, drinking, and pretty much probably, I would say about five nights a week, I was doing that. And so there wasn't too much time that I wasn't drinking. And like you, you know, I wasn't waking up in ditches or anything like that, or I wasn't waking up and having to have a drink, but I certainly was addicted to it in that lifestyle of, yes, this is what I do. And this is part of who I am. And these are the friends I hang out with. And it was years coming that I wanted to stop, which was, you know, I, I understand the challenge of stopping when your entire life is surrounded by drinkers. I was in the industry. Those were all my friends, but I had started when I was 13 years old. And so I had been drinking for a long time. And so when I was about 30, I decided, okay, I, I really, I kept thinking, I want to stop. I want to stop. But that was years of wanting to stop. And I finally was with a guy that was emotionally abusive when he was drinking. And so I said, let's quit drinking for 30 days. And 30 days passed. And I was like, oh my gosh, this aligned with me so much. And I wanted, I wanted to keep it going. He ended up going back to it. We ended up breaking up because of that abusive relationship. But I carried on. I ended up actually getting pregnant shortly after. And uh when I was done my pregnancy, done breastfeeding, I started to get a little bit back into the alcohol. And I had this moment of clarification when I was staring at my daughter. She was one years old. I had been drinking a little too much. And I had this vision basically of knowing or this like knowing in my gut that 100% if I did not stop drinking and living the lifestyle I was leading, she was going to go through the same things that I had gone through. And alcohol was not my friend. And I think that the worst things in my life that happened to me, which was several different uh, sexual assaults, they wouldn't have happened had I not been drunk. And I know that 100%. I wouldn't have put myself in the positions that I had put in putting myself in had I been sober. And I had no respect for myself, no respect for my body. My relationships were absolute garbage. I was just going from one to the next. I was a single mother raising a child on my own. And I knew in my heart that 
she was going to have horrible things happen to her had I not stopped drinking. And that was it. I closed the door on it and I moved forward and my daughter is now turning 17. So it's been a long time being sober, but I can say that it was one of the best things that I ever did for myself was quit drinking. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Congratulations. On Thank doing you. That. you. Thank too. you. Thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, you know, it's funny. Um, well, it's not funny, actually, but you, you mentioned, you know, you were a victim of sexual assault. You know, alcohol is a major factor in, in it's, it's something crazy. I don't know the exact number, but 75, 85% of murders involve alcohol, either the, the murderer or the person being murdered. And, uh, it's present in 90% of all domestic assault, uh, you know, it's, incidents. It, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. with rape too. And with rape. Yeah. It's the only drug known to make people more aggressive, you know, mm -hmm. even, even when they're conscious of their aggression. Mm -hmm. So think of all the other drugs. It's the alcohol is the only drug that makes people more aggressive. I mean, look, there's still there's still very dangerous drugs out there, but they don't make you aggressive like this, mm -hmm. like like alcohol does. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, it's it's it increases your anxiety, your stress, your anxiety. The problem with alcohol is that it makes you do things you don't want to do, mm -hmm. and it has you be someone you don't really want to be. And I would just, I would be, a, how do I put this? Um, you know, look, some people think that I'm controversial in my beliefs around alcohol or my perceptions around alcohol. But the reality is, is that any amount of alcohol is not good for you. Yeah. Like they've done a study that came out in 2022 in the UK that looked at 35,000 British adults. And what they found was that one seemingly innocent drink per night was enough to cause gray and white matter degeneration in the brain. The bumper sticker is one drink a night causes some level of brain degeneration. Now, that's a fact, but that's a proven scientific fact for 35,000 people. There was also a study out of your native country, out of Canada, um, by Professor Tim Stockwell. Um, and he was from, uh, he is, I'm sorry, from the University of, uh, is it British Columbia or is it Victoria? Is that the name of it? What's the name of it? Victoria. That? Yeah, there's UVic in BC. Yeah. But then yes. University of British Columbia is in Vancouver, UBC. UVic. Well, he's from the University of Victoria. Okay. okay. And so Professor Tim Stockwell, he co-authored a comprehensive study that reviewed more than 100 previously published studies on alcohol consumption right and that and these hundred previously published studies involved five million research participants in all five million and what professor stockwell's research revealed was that almost all of these study results that were claiming that a glass of wine was good for your heart mm -hmm. were completely skewed and biased nice now, yeah. now let that just sink in for a yeah. moment yeah okay because everybody says that, right? Like everyone's like, well, isn't wine good for me? Isn't one glass of wine good a day? That's what they say. Now there's this documentary that just came out on blue zones and it's every single person in the blue zone, all these areas, they all drink. And so everyone's like, oh, well, see, we, we can drink. It's good for our health. We're going to live to be a centurion. So, no. So I would just, I would ask each person who's listening to this deep down, Deep down, look into yourself, look into your soul, look into your heart. Deep down, do you honestly believe that a glass of attractively packaged poison is good for you? And that if you have one a night that you're going to live to 100 and it's good for your heart? Do you honestly believe that? Or do you love the fact that there's that study or that you can find studies out there that support what you desire? And what you desire is to be able to guilt-free drink a glass of wine or two or night or have a couple of you know drinks with your friends on the weekend and i would submit that if most people just looked into themselves they would they must concede that deep down they know that drinking any amount of alcohol is not good for them we know we know we Thank know, you. but yes. we're just like, oh, please, please, let's <laughs> have this poison, please, because I'm so damn stressed. I need to have it. 
And because I don't know how to celebrate any other way other than drinking champagne or wine, and I don't know how to be by myself and just be without ingesting some kind of toxin so I can avoid or give myself some uh, give myself a break from just being me. And I, I would submit that most of the challenges that people have in this world, whether it's overeating, whether it's porn, whether it's shopping too much, whether it's love addiction, whether it's playing video games, watching too much TV, procrastinating, all of that is just, we don't know how to be with ourselves. Mm -hmm. We just mm -hmm. don't know how to be who we are because there's so much discomfort and resistance around that. And so we want to break that resistance by distracting ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's, and people don't realize that alcohol is in the top addictive substances in the world, that it's up there with heroin and cocaine. It's just legal. And so when people try and tell me that, oh, you know, it's okay, and this is, it's all socially acceptable, and everybody's doing it, and it's like, yeah, but it is a problem, it's not a problem till it becomes one, and then suddenly everybody looks down on that person that's the alcoholic on the streets, and it's like, where do you think they started out? You know, did they start out the, probably like myself, just partying up in bars as a young teenager? And then they go down that road and suddenly that's not okay. And that's judged. But you at home with your family drinking a bottle of wine every night is somehow justified that that's okay. And I just think everybody's got to wake up and they got to really look at this for what it is. Just because it's packaged beautifully, that it is more sociably acceptable to drink than not to drink doesn't mean that it's not as addictive and terrible for your health as those other drugs are. Maybe those ones are chemically more damaging. I don't know. You can maybe you probably know more than I do about that. But it's it's still extremely damaging. We know that women that drink three glasses a week have a 15% increase in developing breast cancer. And every drink on top of that increases it by 10%. What? Yeah. Like. And you, but you know what's crazy what I've learned? Because I've been doing this since 2015. And by this, I mean supporting people to stop drinking. What's crazy is that it doesn't matter how many times you'll say, here are the health problems from you drinking. People tend to just keep drinking. Yep. And you, you kind of have to really illustrate to people, this is these are the consequences of your drinking on your children or on your marriage or on your parents. And only then do they start to, to, to take it seriously. Look, there are people who obviously are worried about their health and that's enough of a catalyst for them to stop. But in my experience, anecdotally, it's, it's only when you start showing the consequences on their children do they... Um, do they listen? And even then it's yeah. still hard. That's how yes. addictive this 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 drug is. And I'll give you one anecdotal example. Only two evenings ago, I was speaking to a prospective client on a phone call. And this woman was 46 years old. She was a mother of two. She's a dentist. And uh, she lives in um, uh, Wisconsin somewhere. And I was talking to her on the phone and she was, you know, entertaining the idea of potentially enrolling in one of our stop drinking programs, which we have over at Alcohol Free Lifestyle. We have a flagship 90 day stop drinking program. It's been shown to reduce people's drinking by 98%. The University of Washington did a scientific study on this process in first quarter of 2023. The results are being published in February 2024. The professor told me off the record, the results are going to show that there's a 98% reduction in, in drinking as a result of wow. going through your process, right? That's pretty That's astounding. Yeah. yeah. And despite all of this, I was speaking to this prospective client, very nice woman. She told me that she was drinking two bottles of wine every single night, that she was putting her kids to bed and then starting to just starting to drink and drink and drink, but that she was irritable and foggy and that each night she swore she wasn't going to drink and that she was going to focus on financial investments for the family, that she was going to learn how to invest money and she was going to 
and that's what she wanted to do. She also wanted to do some programs, some online programs that she'd been thinking about um, to try and up upskill, you know, improve her skill set. She kind of wanted to get out of dentistry and do something else, but she wasn't doing any of it because she was drinking and numbing herself and procrastinating. And I said, well, what are the, what, you know, how much is this costing you in terms of the amount of alcohol you're drinking? She goes, oh, it's not much. It's only, you know, a few hundred dollars a month. And I'm like, yeah, okay. A few hundred dollars a month might not be that much. And I said, but what do you really want to do? And she goes, well, I really wanted to start my own business. And I said, okay. And this business idea that you've got, how much money do you think you might make after a few years? And she said, oh, with my skill set and everything, I'd say probably maybe half a million dollars in revenue. I'm like, okay, great. That's a good good idea. And what about your health? And she said, oh, I'm probably 40 pounds overweight. And how do you feel about that? Oh, I'm lacking in confidence. I don't feel good. It's causing strain in my, my marriage with my husband. I don't feel sexy. I don't feel confident. It's, it's bringing me down. I said, okay, got it. And how present are you with your children? not as present as I could be. I'm, I'm, I snap at them. I'm irritable. I'm like, okay, got it. Got it. And I'm listening. I'm right? just asking these questions. And so I said to her, I said, okay, so let's just say that in a few years after you'd start a business, you'd be generating half a million dollars in revenue. So we can argue, we could make a point that your current drinking habits are costing you half a million dollars in business revenue over the next few years. And she's like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Okay, yeah. great. And you could get a divorce because you've got marital strain. Is that possible? Yeah. And I said, divorces are pretty expensive, aren't they? She said, yes. So that could cost you another hundred grand in legal fees and blah, blah, blah. So now we're up to $600,000. Studies show that our parent, our children mimic our parents. So if they see mum drinking, numbing himself, procrastinating, not being happy, getting a divorce, chances are your children are going to follow mummy's lead. And they're more likely to end up like that. Would you like that for your children? No, I wouldn't like that for my children. Okay, cool. And these 40 pounds, you're not feeling very confident. You're stressed, you're anxious. Um, you could either keep going the way you're going and not be confident and feel depressed and sad about that for another couple of years, or you can do something about it, lose the 40 pounds and feel confident again. Oh, yeah, yeah, I could. Okay, great. So it's costing you half a million dollars not to do this. It's costing you a marriage not to do this. It's costing you parents not to do this. So you'd like to do this? Oh, I'd like to think about it. Wow. Now, what in God's name do you have to think about? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that is exactly how addictive alcohol yes. is. And this is not a reflection on her. This is a reflection no. on just how addictive alcohol yeah. is. That despite all of the pain she's causing herself, and she's causing her children and she's causing her marriage and she's causing her, her confidence. She still couldn't bring herself to stop drinking alcohol. She has to keep drinking it. That is how Addictive it is. insidious yeah. alcohol is. Yeah. I know I, I can tell so many stories very similar to that, where I have a good friend who is an alcoholic, same thing, kids drinks bottles of wine every night her kids have begged her to stop and she still can't. And she knows it's destroying her relationship, her family, and yet still can't stop. And it's just like, wow. I think, James, do you feel like a lot of people feel like if they stop, A, they have to admit then that they're an alcoholic and that there's a problem. And I think a lot of people associate quitting drinking with going to AA. Like, oh, I'm going to quit. If I have like a big serious problem here, that means I'd have to go to AA, which to for somebody that could be embarrassing. It could be then that's like really shining a light on the problem, which makes me very happy that you and other people have programs that are outside of the a, the typical AA and that there is options out there now for people. Um, but I think that that's, that's a big impact, like has an impact on why people won't quit drinking. Like they just don't, it's like, oh, I can't, I can't be one of those, those people. I get it. I get mm -hmm. it. And that's cultural conditioning that's playing a part there. That's demonizing the idea that if you stop drinking alcohol, that that's okay. Because it's cult cultural, culturally, we think if someone stops drinking alcohol, they must have a problem. Yeah. Now, just a couple of things on what you shared there. The woman I just described in that example, in my view, she's probably not an alcoholic, 
But society would say that she is because she's drinking two bottles of wine per night. I would submit that she's just someone who drinks two bottles of wine per night. But this label that gets thrown around all the time, I'm an alcoholic, oh, I must be an alcoholic, this gets thrown around like candy on Halloween, right? It's ridiculous in my view. Now, are some are there many people in the world who have a chemical addiction? And if they drink, they go to pieces and it's just a disaster. And so we would call them an alcoholic. Yes. But I would submit the woman I was just referring to wasn't an alcoholic. She was just someone who's been drinking far too much for far too long. And we can easily change that and rewire her mindset without medical attention, without having to go to a doctor's. Just disclaimer, I'm not a doctor, but I've been helping people stop drinking since 2015. So I have lots of anecdotal evidence, I guess, to support my belief system and what I'm sharing here. Um, so first, first thing is most people here, you're not an alcoholic, but society says you must be because you've got, you're drinking too much, right? That's my, that's my view. Second thing is I totally get because of cultural conditioning and social conditioning that if you stop drinking alcohol, people might think mistakenly that you're an alcoholic. But the truth is maybe they, maybe it's just that you want to stop drinking and you want to be healthy and you can be healthy. And with a couple of simple little mind rewiring techniques, you easily stop drinking and you live a profoundly incredible life. Right. Um, I get that it's challenging. Thirdly, it's, it might not be your fault that cultural conditioning is the way it is, but it's your responsibility to your family and to your kids and to your husband or your wife to do something about it and to get over yourself, to get over this. Oh, I'm worried that people are going to think I've got a drinking problem. Let me be pretty, pretty tough. Let me give you some tough love here, if I may. Grow up. Grow up. Because I'll tell you, there's two there's two portions of people that we talk to, and fifty percent respond to being kind of like um, bottled a little bit, coaches, coddled <laughs> a little bit. And I've got, I mean, I have amazing coaches. Sarah Connolly and Victoria English are their names. They're educated at Yale and Harvard, and they're so empathetic and they're lovely. And they're our main coaches, right? And I think I'm pretty empathetic and lovely. But there's also another side to me, which is like, just grow the f up, lady, or grow the f up, man. Like you guys are being ridiculous. And here's, sorry, I go on these rants, but let me just show you how ridiculous, especially women are being. And this is not a sexist thing. This is just a biological thing, right? If I may. Yeah. I would submit that most women, when they fall pregnant, stop drinking. They yes. wouldn't dare drink alcohol when they're pregnant because that would be damaging their unborn child and they get burned at the stake socially by society if anyone saw them drinking alcohol while they were pregnant so guess what ladies wasn't it so damn simple for you to stop drinking when you fell pregnant and you stopped for eight or nine months wow that was simple that was relatively easy and yet as soon as you have that child and you started breastfeeding or you finished breastfeeding or whatever, you return to drinking and then you start saying this, oh, it's so hard to stop drinking. It's just so hard. No, it's not. It was so simple when you fell pregnant and now all of a sudden it's so hard. Wake up. That's the dark side of me. That's the tough yes. love side of me. <laughs> well, I kind of feel like on the flip side of that, if if people are not admitting to being an alcoholic when Technically, they are if they're drinking two bottles of night a night, you know, in the in the medical books, that would be called an alcoholic. If we're saying, oh, it's not, you know, if you're not an alcoholic, you can quit. I feel like a lot of people will take that and run with it and be like, oh, James said it's OK. Two bottles of wine doesn't mean I'm an alcoholic, so I don't have a problem. I didn't say you didn't have a problem. Yeah. I said you're not but people will think you that. don't necessarily need to be labeled an alcoholic. Yeah. yeah. Two bottles I of wine that, a night. Yeah. You know, let, let's do the math on this, right? That's about three and a half glasses standard drinks per night. Uh sorry, a bottle. Sorry, seven. 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 Yeah, seven drinks a night. So we go seven times 365. That's 2,555 drinks per year. Okay. 2,555 drinks per year. I mean, is that okay? I mean, 
Is, are, are you really <laughs> like, give me a break. 2,500. I, I know this makes me seem not so empathetic and, and, and I, I understand that. And people might come up with, but, but, but there is no damn, but you didn't drink when you were pregnant. Simple. Now you're drinking when you're not. Now all of a sudden it's overnight. It's become hard. No, for the love of God, please do something about this and wake up because it is compromising your lifestyle and those and those around you. And, uh, you know, those of us who have escaped the matrix of the cultural conditioning and we're alcohol free and, and you notice I'm using the word alcohol free instead of sober. I actually don't like using the word sober or sobriety because it implies to me that you need to stop and that, you know, you 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 have to stop. Ordinarily, you choose to drink this poison, but you 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 have to stop. So I'm six months sober. I don't like that. I much prefer alcohol free because now you're choosing a lifestyle. You're choosing an alcohol free lifestyle as opposed to, I've got to be sober. Yeah, yeah. I, that's I a wish real mind drink. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That because because as soon as we tell ourselves, you shouldn't, you can't, you need to, our hard wiring is like screw you self. I want to do what I want to do. And we rebel because we're creatures of pleasure. And so we don't want to be suffering. And as soon as we tell ourselves we can't do something to us, we relate that to suffering. So I always tell my clients, look, if you're interested in stopping drinking, you cannot just go, I'm going to stop. Today's the day. I'm going to just put it away. No more. I said, it never works. You know that we, I, everyone knows that like you last maybe a couple days, a week, if you're lucky, maybe the 30 days, cause you're doing sober October, which everybody's doing right now. And then you go back to it. You have mm. to change that. Yeah. Like you said, you have to choose to be alcohol free and make it positive. Not this, you can't business and you have to replace it with something. If that is your your go-to pleasure, which for a lot of women in, in middle age, it is. And I'm going to just point out a factor that James and I were talking about prior to recording. Drinking is going down in all demographics except for middle-aged women. And I believe it's because the women that are in midlife, like myself, we're at a, at a really like new place that women have never been in before where we are working full time. A lot of us, we're still managing the homes We're you know, we have a lot on our plate, a lot of stress. And then on top of that, we have this immense toxic load that is completely destroying our hormonal system. And so when we start going through this time, we're more, we've got more anxiety, depression, we're not sleeping. What do we want to do? we want to drink because it's that one time of day when you get to have that glass of wine that you're giving to yourself. And it's like the one thing that you justify giving to yourself just to relax and to take it easy. That's way easier than going, you know what, family, I'm going to go for a massage today. I'm going to go, you know, hang out with my girlfriends for a couple hours. I'm going to go do something for me. Women don't do that, but they can justify while they're making dinner for their family, a glass of wine or many. Mm -hmm. And so if you just try and take this away and just say, I'm giving it up, that's not going to work because you haven't given yourself anything back. So you have to look at it from this really, you know, large viewpoint and go, where in my life can I put in something else that's going to help me to reduce stress? So that overall, my stress is down farther so that I'm not wanting to drink so much. And mm. then if if it's that routine of like, you know, you go for the, I know that uh, I, I interviewed Annie Grace from um, This Naked Mind. And she said, you know, it's it's the reaching for the bottle that makes people relax more than actually the drink itself. And so it's, we're hardwired for this like routine of, okay, it's dinner time. Okay. I can finally have my glass of wine. Oh, and it's just that like, oh, well, you pour it, you have your special glass and you sit there and you cook and you drink and you, maybe you talk with your partner and it's this really nice thing, but overall it's destroying you and it's making you, it perpetuates the need to drink every time you do drink. Mm. So 
replace it with something. And I don't know if you talk about that in your course or not, but yeah, I'm not saying, re- yeah. I'm not saying replace it with, you know, another substance or anything, but You've got to. Yeah, one of our something. what we what we have our clients do is certainly you can keep the ritual of opening a bottle of something at the end exactly. of a long day, yeah. but make the bottle be Perrier or Pellegrino. Yeah, I always say and, kombucha because it kind of has that little. You get a little flush from it. It actually has really small amounts of alcohol in it. <laughs> whatever feels healthy and right for you, like you know. There's so many beautiful drinks that uh, alcohol free drinks that you can make at home by cutting up a piece of lime. Just cut up a piece of lime and squeeze it into soda water with some ice. Delicious. Yeah. There is so many alcohol free alternatives on the market now. I'm actually an investor in a alcohol free brand called Groovy, G R U V I. They're out of Denver, Colorado. They have a great line of alcohol free um, beers and wines. Um, uh, I mean, re- there's no excuse anymore. So look, yeah. so the ritual of coming home and relaxing by opening a drink is fine, but just open up an alcohol-free drink, right? It, that's pretty simple. Like people are more addicted to the ritual than they are the they actual are. substance of yeah. alcohol. Yeah. And um, the other thing is, is like, w- like, why are we stressed and anxious at the end of the day anyway? Yeah, we shouldn't be. We should actually be relaxed and invigorated and like, ah, oh, that was a good day. Yes. Now, yes. now, look, here's the thing. What we do in our stop drinking process isn't really rocket rocket science at the end of the day. What we try to do, like our goal internally for our clients is let's try to reduce their stress and anxiety by giving them healthy habits to implement and hold them accountable. And those healthy habits include ensuring that you get natural sunlight in the morning, going for a walk. We recommend at least 10,000 steps a day, but anything will do. 20 minute walk, getting outside in nature is fine. Taking your shoes off and putting your feet on the ground so you connect to the Schumann resonance, which is an energetic pulse in the earth, which reduces stress and anxiety. Focusing on great sleep hygiene, wearing a pair of blue light blocking glasses like the Swannies uh, at night that blocks the screen making sure you're sleeping in a nice, calm, controlled uh, environment, ensuring that you eat good, healthy, nutritious food, making sure that um, that you're living a life of uh, appreciation instead of expectation, which means we have people write down what's called the daily 20, which is 20 things that they're grateful for every single day in the 90 days that they're with us. And people go, no, 20 things. Oh my God, that's so many. I can't think of do you know how easy it is to write down 20 things if you just sit down and just start writing? And they've done all of this, these studies, like neuroscience shows that when we are writing something down of what we're grateful for, it reduces stress and anxiety. And so what happens is, is that we create this human being. This is before we've even got to alcohol, right? Before we even talk about alcohol, we're creating a human being that is now scientifically proven i'm sorry with scientifically proven strategies to reduce the stress and anxiety so they don't feel like they want to have a drink at the end of the day anyway exactly to relieve them of stress and anxiety because you don't need the drink because you're already calm you're already relaxed you're already in a better state of mind but when we're in a terrible state of mind or a stressed state of mind or a negative state of mind we will do anything to not feel that way, which involves reaching for alcohol or watching Netflix, three three TV series in one night or falling in love with someone who's maybe not compatible with us and being love addicted or going shopping or overeating and, and all those things that I talked about. So before we even get to, to alcohol and, and repositioning alcohol in our life, really what we do is that we just build the human being or we we rebuild the human being might be a more effective way of saying that. So they've got healthy habits and they understand the neuroscience and they're making better choices. And then from there, alcohol ceases to be this thing that we're going to worship at the altar of. It's just this thing that's actually compromising the good feelings that they're getting from all of these healthy habits. Yeah. But that takes work, which many of us, are very, you know, quick fix all the way. And it's much easier just to reach for that glass of wine than it is to go, 
oh, okay, I'm going to work on my stress. I'm going to go for my walk, 10,000 steps in a day. So go into it, you guys, with that tough love attitude of you're going to do this. Like, yeah, it's going to take some work and you're going to have to work at it. But, you know, you know what's more work? <laughs> you know what's more work? Going through a divorce. Yeah. Having kids that don't like you or respect you or aren't, or aren't present with you, don't want to hang out with you. Trying to make money when you've been compromising your money making endeavors. That's more work. It's like you can put in the work in the in the short term, which is only people think that it's going to be so, so hard to stop drinking. It's not. It's yeah. simple. It's really, really simple. And at times it can feel hard, but it's not hard. Mm -hmm. I get that it feels hard sometimes. It ain't hard. Yeah, It's yeah. so beautifully simple. But, you know, you, you got to lean into that initial resistance. But I promise you, on the other side, it's beautiful. Yeah. Once you start feeling good, it really does like give you momentum. And I always say that when people are like, why don't you drink? If they ask me, I'm like, because I cannot handle feeling even a little bit altered the next day, you know, where I'm not a hundred percent or, you know, one drink will compromise me the next day. So it's just not, that's not worth it to me. And it will become that for you. The longer you don't drink for, the more you don't want to feel that way that you did when you were drinking. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that will get you to stop drinking is over time mm. that you get addicted to feeling better. Mm. You know, it's funny. Selfishly, I feel like I haven't really created a very empathetic, comfortable, nice, kind of warm, fuzzy feeling persona in this conversation. Because you've got me on a on a on a uh, on an energy where I, I'm like, I just shake my head at so many people not taking action and getting in their own way. And you know, look, part of it's my responsibility for not being able to get through to these people. And that's a, that's an ongoing challenge for me to try to find creative ways to try to help people wake up. I can't persuade people. I've got to help them persuade themselves. And on this particular conversation that you and I are having, Karen, I've, I've, I've more shown the, uh, it's not cynical, but it's more like, you know, it's tough love. It's more the tough love side of me, but you know, some people will listen to this and they'll respond to the tough love and they'll go, I can hear the passion in his voice and you know what, he's right, let me do something about it. And maybe another 50% are like, I don't like this guy because I want to drink and I need to be, you know, coddled, not coddled, that's, that's the wrong word, but I need to be, it needs to be more touchy-feely and I need to be more understanding. But sometimes it's just, it's so damn challenging for me to feel that way because I know the beautiful lifestyle that people could create being alcohol free. Yeah. But they just keep getting in their own, their own way. I'd like to ask you a couple yeah. of questions about hormones, if I may, and yeah. perimenopause, like what, like for women who are going through perimenopause, what, what's the, what are the, like the, the gasoline you're throwing on the fire ramifications of drinking or not being healthy or being stressed during that phase of your life? Oh, so many ramifications. <laughs> but and let me just say too, James, I hear you and I hear your frustration. I as well get very frustrated at times and really like alcohol is one of those things that it does really bother me, especially now that I have children, because I get so angry that kids are being shown everywhere they look that drinking's okay and that drinking is part of everything that you do in life. But when it comes to midlife women, you know, when we hit about eight, age 38, it seems to be kind of the magic number, 38 and up, we start to lose a really important hormone, which is progesterone. And progesterone is really calming. It is produced after we ovulate in mid-cycle, and it helps us to sleep. It reacts on what's called the GABA receptors of the brain helps induce the, that good night's rest and also helps us not to feel um, as much PMS. So without the progesterone, we get really irritable, really snappy. Um, we bleed heavier during our periods. We'll get more headaches. We get more bloated, more breast tenderness, and a lot more insomnia. So what do we want to do when we feel like that? I mean, like I said before, this is like 
you know, A, you don't want to eat well and you want to drink because it can make you momentarily numb. Mm -hmm. And this is the time in our life, though, where our health is should be forefront because of what's happening internally, because we're losing these vital hormones. We don't want to be drinking every day and taking up that liver space <laughs> when we need our liver to be processing these hormones. We need an adrenal system that's intact because after we lose our ovarian function, we can produce these vital hormones from the adrenal system, which is the stress system, right? So if you're constantly stressed out and not feeling well, and you're drinking all the time, this is a recipe for disaster because now you're not going to have these hormones being pumped out of the adrenal system because it's going to be primarily pumping out cortisol. And that's mm. a life or death hormone. So your body will always make the cortisol first because it's most important. So if you're living in that high stress lifestyle and not sleeping well, which we know we don't sleep when we're drinking every night, you won't get into as much of a good deep sleep. So you wake up Eight, then you're going to become more insulin resistant. When you start losing progesterone and then estrogen, that perpetuates insulin resistance. And what happens? We start to gain weight in our stomach and that starts to get us very unhealthy. So we start getting more and more weight, which is why we see women that have never even had a weight problem their whole life. And they hit perimenopause and they gain 20 pounds in a year all in their stomach. And so it's this perfect storm that's happening. And so if you're drinking on top of everything else that's going on in your system, you that is the worst fuel to the fire that you could be doing. And we, we're being told at this time in our life to pay attention to our body. Our body is screaming at us, look at me, look at me. This is a time in our life where we should be going, what do I want? You know, you've had the kids, you're typically, you're going to keep the partner, get rid of them at this point. You've got your job probably nailed down. And it's the first time in a woman's life where she can look at herself and go, what do I want and what do I need instead of what does everybody else need in my life? And if you're ignoring that and numbing it with alcohol every night, because you can't get in touch with yourself if you're numbing yourself every single night on those feelings that are surfacing. So you can get, if you get rid of that alcohol and you tune in and you can do what James is saying and go, okay, what am I actually grateful for? What do I need right now? Where in my life do I need to make some adjustments so that I can support the hormonal system? I can support my stress so that I'm not wanting to go out there and drink every single night. And it is at any time in your life, this is the most important. I really feel that. And it can be the best time of your life or it could be the worst. Mm. Yeah, well said. That was a masterclass. I, I, I learned a lot from you sharing that. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to add one thing, and that is that women actually require at least 20 minutes additional sleep per night because uh, women's minds are just going at like a million miles an hour compared to men. I mean, men's minds are doing that, but men, women have something crazy like 10 times as many thoughts per day, I think it is. I, it, that might be an exaggeration. I'll have to just get the exact number, but women certainly have so much going on. They're multi, they're naturally better multitaskers than men, and that takes up a lot more glucose in the brain as well. And sleep really restores those glucose levels in the brain, right? It helps us to repair. So women, because they're doing so many different things, right? They're expending more energy, which means it's so much more important that women sleep better throughout the night. And um, if you're drinking alcohol anywhere close to bedtime, you're compromising your sleep quality. In fact, you're better off drinking alcohol for breakfast than you are anywhere close to bedtime, because at least then the body would have 16 hours to get rid of the toxins from the system. Um, the problem is, is that most women are drinking close to bedtime. They're going to sleep. And they're not spending as, as long in that deep REM restorative phase of sleep. Their sleep is compromised. They toss and turn in the night. They're not in that deep sleep REM phase long enough. They wake up tired, irritable, foggy. Uh, then they try to give themselves a pick-me-up with some coffee too early in the morning. Um, you should actually try to delay your first coffee for at least 90 minutes um, if you can. 
uh, in the morning and then they're having a sugary substance as a snack throughout the day to try and give them a pick me up and then they get home or they're picking up kids or they're working in their business or they've got their job and then at the end of the day like oh I just need to relax. I'm so stressed. Let me just pour myself a glass of wine, which then yeah. compromises your sleep, which leads to, to poor night sleep, which leads to fogginess and irritability and the cycle continues, right? Yeah. So yeah. all of that is to say I would implore women in particular to focus on quality sleep hygiene because you need that additional 20 minutes to function you know, appropriately or effectively. And drinking anywhere close to bedtime is certainly going to compromise those efforts. Yeah. And know that at this time in your life is when you have to mind your hormones in order to feel well. And if you don't, it's going to make things that much harder. I mean, even with the drop of estrogen that happens in our mid forties, late forties for some women, estrogen is needed for the production of serotonin. So as we start to lose that estrogen, we start to, for some women, get quite depressed. There's you know, there are studies that show that you know we have a higher risk of suicide in menopause. And so once again, if you're not minding those hormones, alcohol is going to be that much more inviting during that time because you're depressed, which we know alcohol is a depressant but you're going to want to be numbing yourself that much more. So mind your hormones, replace those needed hormones. We know that the safety of bioidentical replacement therapy is there's a, tons of research that shows the safety of that. And it can really help with your mood, with your sleep. So you're not hot flashing and night sweating all night long. And it can give you a really good foundation to feel better, which then in turn could help you not turn to that drink as often or at all. Mm. Mm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And the hormone solution, Karen, you That's are true. a specialist in outlining all of the hormones, especially for women, I would imagine, like getting them firing the way they're supposed to, avoiding them or preventing them from being compromised. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. What are some and of the an educator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else besides, you know, if you, besides a woman who might be going through perimenopause, whether it's a man or a woman, are there hormones that, that you particularly encourage your listeners to, you know, pay attention to and, and how do you do that? Yeah. Even like for men, testosterone, we know that alcohol mm -hmm. will increase the aromatization of testosterone into estrogen. So when we see a man that's got too much estrogen, that's when we'll see that they're typically overweight. They may have some, what, what they refer to as man boobs, um, bloated, not feeling well, depressed, and drinking really perpetuates that. And so just to mind your own testosterone and for women too, testosterone is actually our most abundant hormone, which most people don't know that. We actually produce testosterone first in the ovaries. And then that is then converted to estradiol in the ovaries. So testosterone being our most abundant hormone, you've got to watch that too for women. It's not just for men, it's for women too. And that's going to help with your libido and your muscle retention. And we know that muscle, when the more muscle you have, you know, the more of, able you are to process your glucose. And so it's, it's going to process over 80% of the glucose that you're taking in. And so you need that testosterone to build that healthy muscle to be insulin sensitive, really great for the heart, very breast protective. Uh, there's pregnenolone, there's DHEA, there's oxytocin, thyroid. There's a lot of hormones that naturally go down as we age for men and for women. Um, men, not as much. Um, they're not as impacted as we are. Um, from the hormonal loss. A lot of men will actually keep their testosterone levels till the day they die, which is great. And especially if they're healthy and they're working out. And, and that said, even men that do all of that can still actually lose their testosterone too. So, you know, you always want to be watching that. And if you're feeling a little subpar in midlife, man or woman, 
get your hormones tested. That is the foundation of, of, of how we're feeling, you know, how much of a sex drive we have, how does our skin look? How's our joint health? You know, it's, it, we have estrogen receptors on every cell type in our body. So it's not just about fertility and reproduction. When we talk about sex hormones, it runs our system, all of our hormones and how we're feeling. So once again, mind your hormones as you age <laughs> for both of us, yeah. for, for all species. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel now in this phase of life? May I ask how old you are? 47. How do you feel at 47 now? Like, how do you generally feel? Excellent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If you were going to give yourself a, a rating out of one to 10 in terms of, uh, and we were factoring in physical health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, financial health. Uh, yeah. How would, how would you how what kind of score out of one to 10 would you give yourself? Well, I feel like there's always room for improvement. So I'll say an eight and a half. An eight and a half. Okay. Yeah. And so 10 years ago, what would the score have been? ago 37 oh i was when i was pregnant so <laughs> um it would be a little bit lower probably around a six <laughs> but and what, even at and what 42 would at i would give myself a five at 42 if oh, not okay lower. so only yeah. five years ago it was a yeah. five out of ten yeah why i hit menopause early so I started mm. to lose my hormones and I gained uh, 20 pounds in about six months. I was a complete hot mess. I had something happened with my thyroid and I had a whole kind of storm happen in the hormonal system. And so it was not a good time. And I was doing, I was in the weight loss industry and in, in somewhat in dabbling in the hormone stuff, but it, I definitely got into it more after that. So um, all meant to be. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, five out of 10 at 42, and now you're an eight and a half out of 10 mm -hmm. at 47. That's mm -hmm. pretty damn good. Yeah. Progress equals progress equals happiness, according to Tony Robbins. So I went to a Unleash the Power Within, and he said progress equals happiness, and I, that made an impression on me, I have to say. And I've subsequently seen many studies where it shows that people's happiness can be uh, directly linked to whether they feel like they're progressing in life. And a yeah. lot of the depression and the stress and anxiety and angst in the world comes from people feeling stuck, like they're, you know, almost helpless, that there's no shining light on the horizon, you know, like they're, yeah. they're not progressing. Yeah. Um, if you're not growing, you're dying. I think Tony Robbins is not growing, that too. you're dying. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, I know I can, I, speaking for myself, if I, yeah feel like my business is stuck at any stage i start to feel some a level of discomfort you know yeah me too uh and uh yeah and it's funny you know i'm 48 as i record this and i, I i'm starting to i saw an interesting instagram video from a gentleman the other day and he said he was 48 and i was like oh okay i'm 48 he's 48 let me listen to what he has to say and he goes you know what? I'm 48. The average uh, death of a, a man in America is 78. And let's just say that the five years, you know, from 73 to 78, they're like, eh, maybe they're not that great because your health is deteriorated. That means I've got 25 good years left on this planet and that's it. And I was listening to him. Oh man, that's, that's depressing. Not really <laughs> that's only 25 years. I'm 48 and I only got 25 good years left based on that. I'm like, man, I need to progress a little quicker. And so, and then, so if you're listening to this and you're, you know, you're in your forties or your fifties and you're still drinking and you're still not particularly happy with certain areas of your life and your health is suffering, maybe you got 20 years left, 25, you know, but yeah. statistically speaking, I mean, I hope that I'm going to beat this, beat the average of 78 and live longer than that. But more importantly, I hope I'm going to live longer with a great quality of life. I mean, I don't want to be living a poor quality of life. My mother's husband has dementia and she had him tested again just yesterday. She gave me an update and she's going to have to put him into a home now, probably in the next three to six months. He's now on a waiting list because, you know, he's starting to be really vague and, um, you know, he's 81, I think he's 81. So that's only three years older than the average age that an American man lives to before they die, you know, 81 and his quality of life, his, his 
the cognitive abilities have been lacking for the last three or four years and it's going to get worse you know if we if history is a guide on dementia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm like okay so you know he, he looks like he's the average a little bit more than the average so that means i got 25 years left before possibly statistically speaking i might start to go down that road i don't think it's going to happen because of i've instilled lots of healthy habits but it's statistically likely you know yeah. like and so i keep asking myself well how do i want to spend these 25 exactly good, good years yes Yes. And if, you know, for vanity reasons alone, alcohol is going to age you faster than anything. Oh my gosh. You see the people that aren't, aren't drinking compared to the ones that have been drinking. No offense to, to, to you guys, but there is a difference. Um, just, you know, women are very obsessed about their face, their wrinkles, their water retention, inflammation, mm -hmm alcohol inflames. I see friends that stop drinking and it amazes me what happens to their face in a month, like the puffiness and how much it goes down and the color changes and they feel so much better. Or they look better. They don't even have to lose weight and they feel better and look better. Mm. Yeah. Just a warning. You do get better looking when you stop drinking alcohol. I, I, I really think you do. I do. No, no, it's not a thing. There's no thinking about it. It's actually been proven. In fact, they did a study out of the yeah. UK that showed they showed photos of people to a a, a test group, and uh, one group of people had had just one drink a night for about two weeks, and then they showed the other group of people that hadn't had a drink for two weeks, and they asked them to to, to rate each of the people in each group and level of attractiveness and the the group that weren't that didn't hadn't drunk alcohol they found were infinitely more attractive to the to the group of people the, the 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 people who were looking at the people didn't know who drunk or who hadn't they just had to select who do you find attractive and the non-drinkers were found infinitely more attractive than the drinkers yeah i think this is a really good place to to have everybody really start to is to write down their why if you don't know why you're going to do something you won't do it you won't follow through with it and if vanity has to be one of those reasons that's totally okay you know if that propels you to go okay you know what where do i want to be in 20 years how do i want to look where do i want my kids to end up you know am i leading by a good example right now by drinking every single night whatever your marriage, your job, fin finances, whatever drives you the most, find out how alcohol is affecting that and let that be your why, but write it down, sit down. And that's like, I think that that's such a great place to start because a lot of the time we're staying such a fall going from day to day that you don't actually really think about why you should do something like that. It's like, why would I want to quit drinking? <laughs> These can be why, you know, and if it has to be vanity, that's all right. I always tell people that with the eating and weight loss, like I wanted to lose weight back then because I wanted to go into a clothing shop and put on whatever the hell I wanted. And it, so, yeah, it had a lot to do with vanity. I wasn't going, oh yeah, I could end up with a heart attack. That wasn't enough for me. And like mm. you said earlier, it's typically not enough to know the facts. We know drinking is not good for us. Mm. And if you really think about it, yeah, there's nothing good about it. And I always say this to people, there's nothing good about drinking. You cannot tell me one thing that it's good for. So, well, you can, you can, you, they can certainly you. tell us, but I won't believe it. <laughs> yeah, <me neither>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Karen, thank you so much. Yes. I appreciate you having appreciate this conversation. You. And for my listeners, you can check out Karen at The Hormone Solution. In fact, if you're Karen's listener, you're already listening to this conversation on The Hormone Solution. But for my podcast listeners who are listening on the Alcohol Free Lifestyle podcast, um, go and check out Karen's podcast, which is called The Hormone Solution. And your podcast, are you doing daily episodes? No, we do three three episodes a week. Wow, on alcohol free okay. lifestyle and then we have a newsletter um a, a daily newsletter i send a daily email to people um with tips on how to reduce or stop drinking and health and mindset techniques and you can find that over at alcoholfreelifestyle.com slash guide and you're at james swanick on instagram i'm gonna put all this in the show yeah. notes but yeah just so people know you have a good, a good instagram 
I always get Thank your, you. I always watch it. <laughs> it always keeps popping up on my feed because I go to it and there's always right. really great facts about the drinking. You've just earned a spot on my social media. Here we go. This is Karen <laughs> and uh, Karen Martell from the Hormone Solution. And we're just doing a podcast interview. We're just wrapping up. This is going on my Insta story, Karen. Oh, fantastic. Yes. This has been a great conversation all about why we would want to stop drinking, especially for go. women in midlife. <laughs> the listeners who are wondering what the hell is going on, I was just recording on my Insta story. <laughs> Karen's going to show up on my Insta story now. Thanks, Karen. I really appreciated this chat you with bet, you. You bet, James. It's been a pleasure.